So how we've divided our time is that I'm going to speak very basic about what is film restoration. But to understand film restoration, we're going to speak a bit about why we need to preserve films and what exactly is preservation. And then we're going to look at uh, what do we mean by full-fledged restoration. I mean, that's something which uh, all of us uh, are always asking, that what does restoration mean, actually? And then, um, after my talk, of course, Robin Baker from the BFI will, uh, will take over and he'll talk about philosophy of restoration about the BFI. So let's, uh, let's begin our lecture to understand, actually, first of all, why we need to preserve films. I mean, that, that's something which is uh, the most important aspect in India. And if you really look at it, I want, I'd love to start with the Scorsese quote, that film is history with every film, every foot of film lost, we lose a bit of our culture to the world around us, to each other and to ourselves. And if you, if you look at the way we look at films in India, it's no more, as it says, no more a cultural legacy, but it's a language. And in order to look at the future, one has to look back at the past. And unless we know where we came from, we won't know where to go. So for me, cinema, for people in India, it is the reflection of who we are and where we came from. Yeah. So let's, let's look at, we, we, we've put four important points here. And I want to keep it very simple and basic. So films are a part of our cultural and social heritage. The Indian film industry has completed 100 years and is one of the largest producers of moving images. Yet we have lost a significant part of this history. We have to recognize cinema as not just an evolving art form in India, but as one of the most influential and pervasive forms of art. In order to look at the future, one has to look back at the past. Cinema is a reflection of who we are and where we came from. When we preserve films, we preserve our history for future generations. And films as we see them today are no longer just a cultural legacy, but a language that needs to be preserved for generations to come. So that's the really key reasons why we need to preserve. Of course, there are many, many more reasons, but for me, these are the four crucial points of why we need to preserve. The next slide, yeah. Now, if you look at the uh, statistics, let's look at basic statistics of it. A total of 1,700 <laughs> What is that? Is that fine? Yeah, okay. Uh, the total of 1700 silent films were made in India. According to the National Film Archive of India, they have only five to six complete films left. Um, Raja Harishchandra being the first film, apparently has only two reels left, the first and the fourth. Um, and 12 to 15 fragments in the archive. That means we have lost nearly 90% of our silent films. The film industry in Madras made 124 films and 38 documentaries in the silent era, which only one film survives, Martha Dvarma, which is a Malayali film it's from Canada. You know, those, those days, uh, they used to shoot, most of the films were shot in the south, in, in Chennai, in Madras. So that's a very substantial amount of films which have already been lost the next time. After the arrival of sound, 250 films were made between 1931 and 1941, which only 15 exist. And by 1950, we had lost 70 to 80 percent of our films. Tragically, we've lost our first sound film, Adamara. So we've lost nearly 80 percent of our films till 1950. In 1982, India produced 760 films in 17 languages. Today, we have more than 1,000 films. I mean, we produce more than 1,000 films a year. And the National Film Archive, established in 64, has 5,000 Indian film titles, even though we are celebrating 100 years of Indian cinema. So only 5,000, which includes a large section of documentaries from the Film Division too, which uh, is, is being kept in the vaults uh, at the archive. Yeah. Now, uh, let's look at uh, some of the uh, uh, peculiar problems of preserving films. And I've uh, not only looked at uh, celluloid, but I've also looked at uh, the dilemma, the, di the digital dilemma, which uh, everyone is talking about, that how we could go about preserving uh, films on digital. I mean, with the films which are specifically shot on digital formats. And uh, later, of course, Mithun, uh, from, uh, who's an expert on this, will be joining me in a dialogue to understand 
for independent filmmakers how they could go about preserving films uh, on digital formats. But if you if you really look at the the most important problems, I mean, film is a fragile medium, and <coughs> account of it is very unstable chemical properties. I mean, most of the films early suffered from what is called vinegar syndrome. Um, if, if you notice, uh, even if you've got home movies at your end, and if, I mean, people who've got ADMM films, or or even if you have, uh, you would you would get this peculiar smell like vinegar. And, and that was one of the reasons why they suffered, the early films suffered from what is called Vinegar Syndrome. Uh, before 1950, we had most of the films were being shot on nitrate. Uh, and and uh, you would have heard of famous fires which took place. Uh, one of the important uh, fires which took place was uh, at, the, in, at the FDI, where we lost a large chunk of our films, nitrate originals. We lost an entire collection of silent films. And it was called the Prabhat Vault, where we lost a lot of Prabhat valuable nitrate original material, which was uh, all um, preserved by Nayarza uh, in his time. So we lost a, a lot of sec section of those films. Of course, we've lost uh, also in major studio fires. And, and, and if, if you're growing up at a time when I was growing up, I would always hear uh, films getting burned in, onto a projector. And, and you would see the burning of the film. That was invariably happen with nitrate films, you know. So that's a very important uh, aspect to understand that we lost large portion of our film before 1950 because of nitrate. Now, when uh, celluloid acetate safety films that replaced nitrate, uh, but it, it, it also degraded because, because that it's, it's finally composed of chemical elements. And when you have something which is of chemical elements, depending on where they were preserved on different humidity and temperature controls, you would have problems of preserving it, and that, that would have a loss also. So you had a lot of degradation with, uh, with even cellular acetate safety films. Next slide. Uh, then uh, the, the new dye coupler color emulsion that became standard after uh, 1953 had added complications of fading. Now that's something which has happened with a lot of our films. Like if you look at Gone with the Wind at the NFAI, for instance. Um, you look at, look at the way it's faded, the colors are faded over time. And if it's not preserved in the right condition, and uh, I mean, there's one thing, uh, Robin is here, so I'm, I won't be saying just because of the BFI. Uh, Mary Modi uh, 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 had this print of his, uh, negative of his father, uh, preserved at the BFI for Jhansi Kirani. And it's a technical film. And uh, the reports were so wonderful. I mean, it's so well kept. So it has to be kept in the right conditions so that the colors remain as good as the original way when it was, you know. But uh, most of, a lot of our films have suffered from this uh, uh, color complication with that. And the, with the current shift from celluloid to digital technology, preservation of digital data presents its own dilemma. There is currently no digital archiving master format that has a longevity that is characteristic of a film, which has lasted over 100 years. So we're going to look at this with Mithun. Uh, of course, he, he believes that, 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 that uh, there is, and, and we need to know the reasons why there is, and, and how we, we want to keep migrating from different formats and different uh, uh, ways to preserve films. We're going to look at that later with him. Yeah. We're going to look at that later with him. Yeah. So the, these are the, really the peculiar problems uh, which films are posing for us all the time when you're going about preserving films. Yeah. Uh, this is just to show you uh, the the physical damage which which a film can have. I mean, you can look at it, scratches on the film, tears of the film, water spots. Uh, biological damage could be mold, bacteria, and insects if it's not preserved well. And the chemical reactions has color fading, gelatin layer drying, brittle becoming brittle, shrinking, curling, and awful uh, older film become flavorable. So these are the key features of. Uh, what films can pose as a, I mean, uh, especially, especially uh, one of the, I mean, the big uh, problem has always been if it's not stored well and not, uh, we're not kept in correct humidity control or temperature control uh, rooms. Yeah. <clears throat> now, uh, so one of the uh, things which uh, I keep talking about is, uh, is where, where did we begin from films? I mean, did films actually begin? Did Edison in, invent uh, films, or was it Murray, or was it Dagger, or was it William Friesen in England, or was it Mybridge, or was it Lumiere? 
So who invented cinema? Or, or should we keep going back to our respective civilizations? You know, uh, when I was a child, my father would uh, uh, drive me from uh, Bhopal and he would take me to the Bhimbetika paintings. Now, if, you, if, you, if you've ever been to Bhimbetika paintings, you will see this, uh, uh, the, the beautiful uh, carvings and drawings of, of uh, a daily life of a farmer or a, or a villager. And, and that itself depicted motion. You know, it depicted motion, it de depicted reality, it depicted, it gave me a sense of, of motion. And, and to me, cinema begins right from there. And, and that is what cinema is. It's, it's, it's the depiction of, of reality and, and the way you interpret it. And, and we've been interpreting it differently. So when it did come, we have to understand it, it's come back all the way from there. It's, it's, it's another form of art. And, and, and if we are going to preserve uh, paintings in, in our museums, why can't we preserve films? Because it's all grown from there. Um, a lot of people uh, talk about ancient uh, culture, which we which we inherit from. I mean, if you look at uh, if you look at the art of Chitrakati, for instance, where paint, pictures were painted in a series of a long scroll, and the painter Chitrakati would decide alongside. Chitra means picture and Katha means story. So this folk art involved a person who narrates the story with the aid of visual support. So it was logical for cinema to evolve from art. It was a new form of art. And uh, I like what Godard said, you know, cinema is not art that, uh, that films, sorry, cinema is not an art that films life. Cinema is something between art and life. Unlike painting and literature, cinema both gives to life and takes from it. So that's the key for me because because we have to understand where cinema has come from, where we have where we have come today. We have to look back at the past to understand where we have to go. Um, now we're going to look at uh, uh, the next slides. I'm, I'm going to look at some some of the very basic. Uh, uh, Understanding the basics of archiving. Uh, these, these are these are certain certain things, certain terms which most of us uh, uh, would know, but uh, it requires a little deeper understanding of what we need to do when we are archiving films. Uh, by conservation, uh, what we mean is it's very important to 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 conserve the original material. When we talk about preservation, preservation literally means duplication. But by conservation, we mean that you must have the original uh, material to be preserved in its own condition. And that's really, really important. That, that's why uh, if you can get hold of an original camera negative or, or even your home movies or any of the original material, they need to be first protected and conserved. And that is very important before we can get into preserving them. So conserve first. Conserve what you have, and they need to be done. You know, many times when we are restoring films, we forget that uh, the original material also needs to be looked after. We scan them out and we go ahead with the with the new formats. We forget about the old stuff, and and that's something which is really really important that we need to look at cons conserving what the original material is. So that's why conservation is very important for any archival practice. And uh, the other uh, one more thing that. When we're looking at conservation, we should be looking at not just feature films, but experimental films, documentary, newsreels, short films, animation films, advertising films, home movies. For, so all possible visual mediums, I mean, all possible visual art mediums should be conserved in whatever you can get. Yeah, that's very important. Now, uh, preservation, of course, means duplication of the original format of film to ensure that the new format matches the quality of the original and preserve its essential features. It also covers, covers the, the digitization and migration to new formats. The preservation copy is what will be utilized for public access. So any archive which has a preservation copy, that's the copy which needs to be given out for public access. The original uh, the material which needs to be conserved has to be kept back in the archive. So preservation is 
is the duplication. And that's important between the two. You really need to differentiate between the two of the things. Um, now, uh, the steps to preserve films. I mean, if you really look at the steps to preserve film, uh, locate and acquire endangered films. Challenges are many companies didn't save their early films. Now, that's very, very important. Uh, you know, uh, we haven't done enough to look for uh, older films. And we've only concentrated, unfortunately, only on feature films. Uh, look at the wonderful documentaries being made all over the world um, if, by Indians. And uh, also, a large section of our Indian films are lying in countries like uh, Algeria or Luxembourg. And we haven't done enough to find those Indian films. Some of them have been lost. We've declared them lost. So I think it's really important for us to locate and acquire the, uh, not only the lost film, but indeed the films. Uh, physically preserve and maintain the film. That's very important. That uh, the conditions you want to keep the film, uh, after you have preserved it, that means you've duplicated it, not only the original, but also the, the duplicate copy needs to be kept in correct storage vaults and, and, and they have to be demarcated between original camera negatives, master positive, interpositives. They have to be kept in all separate walls so that, so that there, is, there is clear cut documentation and, uh, and uh, demarcation between each formats and that. With respect to whether they were restored or whether they are brand new films, I can assure you up until December I was associated with close to 560 odd films that came out of our country. And almost all of them went through a very similar process. I mean, I don't know if you can pull up that slide. Again. Colors, any of any of those slides. So you no, maybe the next. Yeah, colors to put it. Yeah. So you'll notice that uh, you know even if you shot on let's say film or digital, you would first bring in your material on a scanner, or you would import the file directly onto your color correction machine or your you know um, editing machine. Then you would go into the process of actually working on it, color correcting it, improving it in uh, the methodologies that were intended by the DOP and the director, and then finalizing it. Now, the finalization process is where I think everyone kind of doesn't pay attention. And I think mm -hmm. I need all of you all to ensure that we do moving forward. Because most of, of you all would just say, hey, you know what, give me a DCP, give me a HD cam SR, we're good. Now, the problems with doing that, and uh, Shirisa was one of the odd ones out who said, no, I want to make sure I back this up as well. But the rest of them, what they would do is say, hey, you know, our shelf life is for about a, a, a week. That's those three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then we're done with our film till we get telecast uh, rights and till we start broadcasting our material. Unfortunately, uh, that it doesn't end there, right? You need to put your data onto some format that will last you uh, for some time. And going through that backup process, you know, that is almost yeah. as critical as all of these other things that are mentioned there. Your DCPs, your HCCAM SR, your blah, 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 your DigiBeta, your DVD, your Blu-ray, all that is just, you know, a one-off thing that you're doing to please your producers and your production house. I mean, you need to make sure you give them those copies so they can distribute your material, which is very important but also preserving it for yourself so tomorrow you know you will have people coming back to you and saying hey can i uh, get you know uh, one of these films to put it out onto telecast and you'll have to run back to your camera negative you shouldn't be doing that is what i think the onus of this discussion is you should have a format that is already readily available on a long term storage format like an lto which will allow you to uh, migrate that data to the different formats that need to be delivered so having an LTO backup, like this LTO3 that he has a celluloid man, uh, there we put his DPX files onto that uh, LTO. The, those DPX files are, uh, again, without getting too technical, have about 10 bit of dynamic range. It has uh, color information that is sufficient to uh, last him uh, the process of not having to rescan. So now when you know it's moved to LTO6, his process is only a migration cost, not a reprocess of the entire, you know, uh, restoration bit. So you're only having to migrate from one tape to another uh, because of, you know, uh, better technologies being available. So I, I think uh, emphasizing on making sure you put your data onto an LTO format and choosing a format that will last you a while is very, very important. But keep in mind somewhere at the back that, you know, he mentioned four years, I would say, 
at least five to six years is a good period of time to right. maintain your data structure. Post that, you have to look at the migration cost. You know, uh, it's getting cheaper and cheaper. Like when he put it on LTO3, uh, back then one LTO tape could only contain about um, 750 uh, gigs of data. But now with LTO6, and that time you, you would have paid quite a bit of money for each of those tapes. Uh, now that tape cost has come down by a third and the volume size has increased by almost double. So you can put 2.5 TB of data on one tape. Same, same data, yes. just migrated to a newer format. So it's absolutely important to keep in mind that migrating your data regularly, maybe in spurts of five years, is important. And the other alternative, which we discussed in your office, was to not put that burden on yourself. There are big data companies out there, uh, Amazon being one of them, uh, you know, Google being the other one, I don't know about the BFI, you know, maybe they have their own archives and stuff like that. But access to independent filmmakers and the likes in the audience, uh, I think all of y'all are open to, you know, uh, purchasing this online space that is freely, I mean not freely, I wouldn't say go to the free option, I'd say put some money into it so they'll allocate good resources to you. Uh, Amazon has this thing called Amazon Web Services, it, it abbreviates to the S3 platform. It's extremely cheap, it's like one cent per GB, yeah, that's like completely inconsequential money to all of us I think. You just need to upload your data there once, they put it into deep archives, you know, where you're probably never going to see it again, until you want to, yeah. So you just log in, pull it up, you know, restore, I mean, whatever, access it and do what you want. And it's extremely cheap and convenient. So then you don't have to deal with LTO 4, 5, 6. It becomes their problem. Right. They, keep migrating, they keep migrating, uh, migrating the data. They keep paying the fees for it. As a service charge, yeah. 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 So that's another alternative to actually doing it yourself. If you can't afford the infrastructure or if you can't afford the equipment, it's better to offload that as a service fee to somebody else. But the emphasis, I think, uh, based on what he mentioned, and I, I also want to point out, is backing up your data and maintaining integrity and my, keeping in mind that you need to migrate it is absolutely important. Otherwise, you're losing a bit of yourself every time you're putting your film out there. It's just BCP. Right. Right. All right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So that's uh, that's all for for restoration and uh, preservation, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we'll have a break and then uh, it's, I'll hand it over to Robin uh, who will take you through his philosophy of preservation and restoration at the BFI. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.